I believe the connection problem. There is a connection problem. The video is not coming fine. The host may discontinue. Sorry, there is a connection problem. It seems uh, very sorry, Doctor Vasco would have the entire program. <laughs> there was the five days description in the film. Anyway, uh, there is a connection problem from the end of the host. Um, and there has been rain in our part of the country this time for the last few hours. So there has been heavy rain. Welcome, Doctor Janet Vasco, and so nice that you could get up in the program early in the morning. So it's okay. Uh, Let's get going. Uh, without any spending any time, let me quickly introduce the chairperson of today, uh, today's session, Dr. Ruchi K. Jaggi. I have been immensely lucky to be a colleague also of hers once upon a time. So nice to have her, uh, who has been uh, you know, in two premier universities of the country, Amity, and today she's Dean of Symbiosis heading the media and communication division, the school. So she'll be chairing the session and everyone already knows very well about uh, Madam Vasco, but I think uh, it's good if uh, Dr. Ruchi introduces her and the topic. And we'll have a bit of India touch to the topic from, uh, from Dr. Pradeep Malik later on. And Pradeep Malik sir is also uh, a four ranking media guru of India. He is heading the media education in Pandit Dindal Petroleum University, PDPU, Gandhinagar. Indeed, it's a pleasure and an honor for us from Adamus University. I, as the Provost Chancellor, uh, once again express my gratitude towards IAMCR Central Body and the India Ambassador, Dr. Umar Shankar Pandey, for uh, teaming up with us and including the three media organizations who are covering it, the Ananda Bajar Group, ABP, the, yesterday's talk was already covered and uh, they will be covering today's talk as well. Uh, IndiaReal.in, which is live telecasting at this point of time, this session, uh, I mean, uh, video streaming across Facebook Live and YouTube Live. Adamus University's Facebook Live and YouTube Live is also video streaming. And the Policy Times, which is also video streaming. And good to see many Professors and researchers from all over India and a few from abroad have already joined in. We'll be expecting many more as uh, the evening proceeds. So with this little introduction, and it's good to see world's or rather global leaders in communication research. They, along with the media gurus of India, coming together on one platform and creating this beautiful experience, a very motivating experience. And we hope that this will continue through collective efforts of us who have come together on this platform. Over to Dr. Ruchi K. Jaggi, Dean of Symbiosis International University to chair the session. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Chaudhary. Thank you so much, Dr. Pandey, for making me a part of this fascinating uh, program that you have both put up together. Thank you so much to International Association of Media and Communication Research uh, I've had the pleasure of listening to Professor Vasco for the last few years in some IMCR conferences. 
and uh, i do not know if this opportunity could have got created actually in a physical conference so i would like to look at the advantage of this opportunity that got created where dr uma shankar pandey and both professor ujjwal chaudhary both of them have been extremely instrumental in creating this but i am honored and delighted uh, to be hosting uh, professor vasco directly in this session we have all always looked up to her through these so many stellar years of leadership that she demonstrated as the president of iamcr and uh, there's been so much to learn from her in so many ways you know i've always i will always remember her for being that one person who as the president of iamcr had no time to breathe but any young scholar who would reach out to her and try to kind of have a brief conversation with her was always encouraged to do so and and a few years ago i was one of them you know i had my fan girl moment with her like a few years ago in lester and uh, today i feel like a fan girl once again where i have the pleasure of now introducing her and her work to all the researchers who have joined us here on the session so first a very warm welcome to you professor janet vasco from all the media and communication academic fraternity of india and of course south asia and some other countries from where some colleagues might have joined us uh, just uh, because we should do this and you should know uh, the the bandwidth that professor vasco uh, reflects uh, dr janet vasco is a professor of media studies uh, at the university of oregon usa she's author co-editor of 22 books including understanding disney the manufacture of fantasy a companion to television uh, global media giants and that's also the subject that she would be addressing today as already uh, mentioned she was the uh, president of international association of media and communication research till about a month back uh, when she uh, uh, moved out right and uh, uh, professor vasco actually has uh, a lot of scholarship in the areas of political economy of media where she focuses on media industries and companies with an emphasis on issues relating to ownership control and power and much of her work has focused on the us film industry and the walt disney corporation uh, what is so exciting right now about this topic is when the line between who is a media giant and who is a technology giant is blurring i don't know that in the time to come are we going to talk about walt disney or are we going to talk about facebook amazon and googles of the world and i think uh, with the whole world moving towards like a virtual mode uh, how much do you own technology uh, does that become like the 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 sort of a litmus uh, test for how solidly you are going to control the media networks in any uh, country or in any society is the kind of discussion that we would really like to have at the end of this session also uh, as we had a very fascinating session on the digital divide yesterday uh, with dr gladkova talking and i think it is such a nice uh, a uh, movement uh, a sequential movement from discussing issues of access and discussing issues of digital divide to exploring how the world's media is controlled by a few media companies and yet we all as media scholars still believe in the illusion of diversity of media content i think that's the sort of a contradiction and irony we continue Uh, to kind of nurture in our own minds and as professor vasco will shed more light on it i think we will have more discussions questions and deliberations coming at the end of the session colleagues are requested to post their questions in the chat box and depending upon the kind of time we have at hand we will continue to take as many questions as possible right and uh, I am very very once again grateful to Professor Vasco for sparing her time. Thank you to Dr. Uma Shankar Pandey, the IMCR ambassador for India for organizing this fantastic uh, uh you know uh, uh, rendezvous that he's done for all of us and to Professor Ujwal Chaudhary who I have had the pleasure to have as my boss in my initial years and now i'm delighted that he continues to support the media fraternity in so many ways and i think uh, let's all make this entire experience enriching for us and welcome once again professor vasco over to you hello everyone um uh, i hope you can hear me okay yeah 
uh, yes, yes, I have, yes. yeah, I'm extremely happy to be here. Um, I uh, am very, very impressed uh, by the organization of this event. And I want to specifically thank, as everyone else is, Uma, uh, who is the IMCR's ambassador, who I think has contributed so much. Uh, I think I participated in another one of his seminars uh, virtually a few years ago. And here, this amazing event uh, that he put together with his um, uh, colleagues at Adamus and so forth, it's, it's, it's just excellent and I really wanna thank you. And it's an honor to be here to talk to you. Um, I also want to thank, uh, um, actually uh, someone else who is go you're going to hear tomorrow, uh, Graham Murdoch, for his um, uh, nurturing of the ambassador program for IEMCR. Uh, and I think uh, he's really built it uh, at, when he was vice president. Uh, and uh, Uma is an, a, a, a really excellent example of the kind of activities that the ambassadors uh, are doing. Um, I'm very pleased also to be speaking at this event because I have very, very wonderful memories of meeting, uh, the IMCR meeting at the University of Hyderabad and working with uh, uh, Usha uh, Rahman, uh, who was on the program yesterday. So it, it's great uh, to be with you, even though I am in Eugene, Oregon, and you are across the world. And it's morning here and it's evening there. I think now I need to go to my uh, screen, uh, if we can manage that, um, to introduce my topic. Okay, is that, uh, is it, okay, good, good, good. Okay, um, I, uh, thank you, uh, Ruchi, also for that fantastic introduction, and and just just and uh, just to say that yes, uh, I do want to be talking uh, uh, about Disney today. Sorry to those who have heard me talk about it before, but it's going to be in the example uh, I use and often use in terms of uh, doing the kind of work uh, that uh, I'm gonna be talking about, which is uh, doing corporate research, co research related to uh, media corporations and global media corporations. So I wanna start out, um, with uh, uh, an overview of, of what I'm going to be uh, trying to cover. Uh, this will be a, a brief discussion, uh, first of all, with uh, the, the issue of um, uh, different kinds of methods to teach, uh, to, to study, to research uh, media corporations, any corporations, but we're especially interested in media corporations. Um, and I want to do an overview of the kind of uh, methods there are, looking more closely at one in particular, document analysis, uh, and talk a little bit about that. And then uh, I promise that after that, when we talk about Disney, it might get a little more lively uh, or interesting or colorful. <laughs> but I, the, the, the process of doing corporate research sometimes isn't so exciting in a way, it is a lot of work as other kinds of research, uh, uh, at least most of you know, uh, proves to be. Um, so I am also coming from uh, uh, an approach uh, as Ruchi Mint uh, uh, mentioned uh, called the study of political economy. Uh, specifically of media and communication. And I want to, here we are. So uh, many of you know, some of you do work in this area, uh, the critical study of political media, uh, uh, political economic study of media and communication uh, has been around for quite a while now. And, but I still think it's, it's growing and growing internationally and is still really, really uh, necessary 
continues to be necessary to look at these issues uh, in re relationship to uh, media, the study of media, uh, in order to understand uh, really fully uh, what's uh, the implications, the importance of, uh, of media. And for those of you who have uh, studied this um, approach or maybe even use it, but maybe also have somewhat uh, uh, some familiarity with it, uh, one common uh, definition uh, that's offered, has been offered uh, is from Vincent Mosco. Uh, and uh, he defined uh, this uh, approach as uh, the study of, this, of social relations, particularly power relations that mutually constitute production, distribution, and consumption of resources, specifically communication, I would add media resources. So this one definition, there are many others. I think an important point here to underscore is power, power relations, and also resources. Those are very key notions in the study of political economy. Someone else also discussed political economy as applied to media. This is Dallas Smythe. Uh, uh, he uh, in the 50s described the study of political economy uh, of communication as looking at the structure and policies of media and communication institutions in their social settings. There are a variety of institutions that are involved with media and communication, of course. Uh, but I would, I would argue that uh, still, uh, media institutions, some of the most important media institutions are corporations. They continue to, in many parts of the world, uh, dominate the media in, in, our, in our countries and, and actually uh, around the world. Um, so to look at, to study, to understand uh, corporations, I still think is, is, is quite important. Um, and that's, uh, uh, it, it's not the only important uh, component uh, of media, as, as, as we'll see, but uh, it still seems to me to be very important to understand corporations um, and therefore to know about this kind of analysis might be, uh, uh, might be important. Um, I also, though realize that just studying uh, corporations and financial kinds of issues and so forth is not the only, only thing we should be concerned with. And I, I wanna point to some components of uh, the study of corporations um, that I think have become extremely important. I think we need to think of this kind of study in a holistic way, uh, I think it needs to be integrated, meaning integrating, uh, integrated with other kinds of approaches, other types of analysis. Thus, it needs to be interdisciplinary, uh, excuse me, uh, potentially transdisciplinary, if, if it's possible, and also uh, systemic. We need to look at these uh, uh, corporations as part of networks, as part of systems. Uh, so it's broader than just looking at uh, a corporate organization uh, that sometimes people get the impression that, that uh, politically, uh, people who study political economy are only interested in that. Uh, so keeping that in mind, um, I want to suggest something just uh, to see uh, if it works for anyone, uh, that an expanded study of corporations might be involved with an expanded version of critical political economy, and I'm going to call that critical critical political economy plus. Uh, it is not just uh, political; it's not just economic. It's more broadly related to other kinds of issues and other kinds of, of approaches to understanding media. I want to give you some specific examples of this, and I will be uh, applying this uh, to Disney at the latter part of the, the, the talk. Uh, but also I want to mention uh, a, a, another uh, study that's been done that some of you may be familiar with, um, a book that collected various um, uh, 
uh, studies of media corporations around the world. And this was an edited collection um, that I was involved with, with my colleagues, Benjamin Birkenbein and Rodrigo Gomez. Uh, and uh, the, the project was to look at the, uh, some, of the some of the largest global media corporations, but also looking at the way that corporations dominate in some regions of the world. And so uh, we ask uh, individual authors to uh, do this kind of um, uh, analysis, <clears throat> a historical analysis, an economic profile of uh, the corporation, uh, political profile, but also I'm highlighting uh, this uh, point that we also ask them to do uh, cultural profiles, uh, talking about looking at corporations of what they represent symbolically, ideologically, uh, noting uh, their products, services, and so forth, uh, their imports, exports, cultural issues, um, uh, were supposed to be highlighted. Um, the book covered a, a number of different um, companies around the world, global media giants for sure, but also regional and geolinguistical giants in certain parts of the world, uh, and also overviews for different regions around the world to look at the strong uh, uh, companies and corporations uh, that often dominate. And again, we did include some of those tech companies, which uh, Rushi mentioned, uh, and continue to uh, actually, uh, uh, we're continuing with this kind of analysis in a book series uh, that, that is focusing on individual corporations and we're continuing to work with researchers to, um, to publish those, um, those uh, studies. So I want to get into some more details about different kinds of methodological approaches used to study, um, not just political economy of media, but used to specifically study um, corporations. Now, some of you may have done this kind of work uh, I think it is similar in a way if you if you have been a journalist, an investigative journalist. Uh, sometimes those kinds of uh, uh, issues and the kind of analysis that is that's done are very, very similar. Um, there are a lot of different uh, approaches to this kind of study. And I want I only have time to mention a few. So this is just a kind of brief overview again. Uh, I want to mention two uh, general approaches specifically to studying corporations. There are others, but these are two that, that have been used uh, over the years, uh, specifically power structure research and social network analysis. Uh, uh, let me just br uh, share a little bit more about both of those. Uh, power structure researcher, uh, research uh, has been around for a while. In fact, uh, uh, this is drawing on um, uh, a website that was uh, opened uh, quite a few years ago by a colleague uh, at the University of Oregon, Val Burris, uh, in connection to power structure research. Uh, and uh, he defines it as uh, the study of power that highlights the unequal distribution of resources upon which power is based and looks at power structure research in terms of its roots in the 60s and in the 70s and provides lots of information. This, this site is still online. It's not uh, active uh, anymore, but it, it gave a very nice overview of the kinds of issues that are involved with power structure research. Uh, it actually did emerge, and this is from the site as well, it emerged uh, really uh, kind of at the turn of the 20th century uh, with muckraking uh, uh, activities in the United States at least. Uh, and I think uh, it's often involved with kind of uh, uh, Marxist approaches to studying uh, corporations. Um, 
And most recently, um, I think it's important to note that it, it, it has expanded beyond just issues of class, which of course uh, traditionally has been a part of political economy uh, and Marxist approaches, but um, it's really these days incorporating, involving uh, analysis of uh, race, gender, and class uh, woven together. And I think that's a really important point to keep in mind. Um, also, if we turn to a more recent uh, development in doing this kinds of, kind of work, we have social network analysis, which some of you may be familiar with. I'm not to, gonna go into a lot of detail about it, uh, but it has been described um, in many ways, but I think it boils down to looking at the structure of relationships uh, across organizations involving individuals and lots of uh, 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 resources and uh, looks at networks and their the relationships of uh, uh, components of those networks. Uh, and as noted here, uh, it also emphasizes, it seems to, uh, as it says here, lend itself naturally to data visualization which are kind of interesting uh, uh, looks at webs of relationships. And here's, there's one uh, uh, here uh, on the screen that's, that's quite complex and it's a little blurry, but it's not important necessarily to look at the detail at the moment, but just see the kind of uh, images and visualization, visualizations that are created by social network analysis. Um, Actually, I think that uh, these techniques have been around for a while in terms of looking at networks and relationships. And I wanna give you just another example of one that I did quite a while ago, actually as part of my dissertation, uh, when I looked at uh, uh, banking institutions, banks and the film industry, US film industry, and create, looked at issues like uh, uh, connections, interlocks between banks, companies, stockholders, and so forth. And so this was way before uh, social network analysis or you know, computer, the use of computers and so forth. Uh, but it represents, I think, a similar kind of approach. And, and also, um, I think, similar techniques uh, in terms of finding information, putting it together, and analyzing it. The specific methods that are you often find yourself involved in if you're looking at corporations, uh, first of all, lots of documents. Document analysis has become uh, a kind of acknowledged method these days in looking at uh, communication, media, other kinds of um, areas. And uh, I wanna uh, go into more detail about that because I think it's a, a uh, very uh, strong uh, part of doing uh, corporate analysis. Uh, also uh, uh, involved, if one is fortunate enough to be able to do interviews with uh, corporate players, uh, corporate uh, executives, uh, uh, corporate uh, people who work at corporations and so forth. That's a very important part of uh, uh, research as well, but sometimes it's problematic. Uh, participant observation, probably even more uh, 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 difficult, although some of us certainly have worked for companies, uh, media companies, and have insights and also uh, the potential for doing research as a participant uh, is, still, is still possible. Also, ethnography is another component that might be uh, employed, and I think uh, Graham Murdoch is going to talk tomorrow about ethnography. So I'll um, just mention that that also is a possibility to give insights uh, into corporations. Um, examples of the kind of uh, sources for uh, documentary sources. I wanna go into a little bit of detail, but just it's still not, it won't be too long. Uh, in terms of looking at the, the wide variety of documents that we find ourselves looking at uh, in order, well, when we do research generally, but also specifically when we're looking at 
uh, corporations. And they're everything from uh, manuscripts and uh, material that could be found in archives, uh, government reports, which I'm going to talk about a bit here, uh, other kinds of uh, records and, and uh, uh, publications uh, from a corporation and so forth. But there are a wide range of, of documents involved in, in, in uh, document analysis. Um, uh, but what do we, uh, what do we, what are some of the issues involved with doing this kind of uh, work? Uh, one, of course, I've already mentioned is access. Uh, not uh, access to actual people uh, sometimes is difficult, but access to documents sometimes is difficult. And I think that uh, access is is wide ranged. Um, it depends on uh, different kinds of uh, issues, different kinds of documents. Documents can be closed, they can be open or public, they can be restricted. Uh, that's difficult. Uh, they can be deliberately hidden. That's difficult. Uh, the other point here is also authorship, the issue of who produced a document and why, uh, uh, whether it's a personal document or an official document or uh, uh, written specifically for uh, representing the corporation or uh, written for a government uh, 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 inquiry or whatever. The authorship of a document therefore needs to be uh, taken into account. Also, we have various techniques in terms of what do you do with documents? How do you in in interpret them? Uh, how do you analyze them? And again, uh, this involves, uh, depending on the documents, depending on uh, your approach, um, quantitative and qualitative assessment. Uh, qualitative, a quantitative could be a content analysis, uh, which some of you are familiar with. Uh, and again, social network analysis to, to actually qu look at quantitatively at these documents to get a sense of, uh, uh, of what they include. Uh, we can also analyze documents and often do in terms of qualitative assessment uh, using perhaps grounded theory. Uh, there's qualitative content analysis which, analysis, which often becomes various a, a form of uh, interpretation or interpretive analysis. So there are different techniques involved with uh, looking at assessing, analyzing documents. There are also, uh, uh, and I think it's important to uh, take this into account, uh, there's also criteria in which one can use to look at documents. And I draw on, as many have, John Scott's uh, book years ago, uh, sociologist, British sociologist John Scott, uh, who wrote about uh, uh, doing document analysis and argued that uh, there are these various criteria that, that we can use and should use. Uh, this, by the way, becomes important when people ask you uh, the legitimation to legitimize the kind of research you're doing. In fact, for instance, if you're doing dissertation research and using this kind of approach, you might be interested in defending how you have done the analysis and you want to have a criteria in which uh, to employ in your analysis. Scott argues that first uh, uh, you want to look at authenticity. And again, that involves authorship. Who's the real author of a document? Is it forged? Is it, is it uh, 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 written for a uh, uh, promotion? Uh, is it written as, as a satire? Is it uh, 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 a fake document, in other words? Um, this becomes especially important as we're looking at a lot of documents online these days. Uh, so it's an important issue to consider. Uh, the, other, the, the next issue would be credibility, how accurate, how sincere, uh, what are the material interests of the author, and I think that's very, very important, their motivations, the motivation of the document itself, uh, and what interest there might, might be, the credibility, 
who is the person or persons who are creating these documents. Uh, then representativeness, how representative is the document? Uh, if you're just looking at one document, is it telling uh, the whole story or even a lot of the story? Uh, we have to take into account that not everything is recorded. There are things that go on that aren't documented. Not all documents survive. Uh, and so we have to be aware of how representative a document is. And of course, we want to uh, look at the meaning and understand the meaning of documents. Um, and this involves uh, taking into account the context in which they're produced and all of the other um, uh, points that we've mentioned, uh, and also using uh, either those quantitative or qualitative approaches to understand or interpret or uh, read the document uh, to try to get its meaning. Um, investigating corporations in terms of not just document analysis, but other kinds of analysis, uh, we're interested in a lot more than just how much a company has made. Uh, so just a very uh, 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 quick list of the kinds of things that one might be interested in, uh, in terms of doing this kinds of, uh, uh, kind of analysis. Uh, what a company owns, uh, who owns them, what a company owns uh, is very fundamental. Um, financial status, finances are still important in terms of how large a company is, how well they're doing, what their status is, their assets, what, how much debt they have and so forth, tax payments and so forth. This gets into uh, issues that you might think, well, I'm not an accountant, I, I can't understand all that. We need to understand kind of basic, basic uh, uh, financial uh, uh, information. Uh, we do really need to look at stock ownership if there is stock related to a company, which it, there usually is. Uh, we need to look at uh, boards of directors and who they represent, how they interlock with other companies. Uh, we need to look at their relationship, corporations relationships with banks, not only in terms of loans, but other kinds of uh, connections. Uh, lawsuits, legal relationships that a company may have are of interest. Political contributions, that's especially important, for instance, in the United States. Uh, and uh, of course, workers, labor, trade union relationships are vitally important. Uh, and of course, if we want to look at competition or the lack of competition, uh, relations with other companies. Uh, these are all of interest and sometimes lead us to other issues, but also uh, help us, I think, in terms of understanding a corporation and uh, uh, how it arrives at what it produces, how it produces, and what kinds of effects that has. Specifically, the kinds of uh, documents we find in the US, and uh, my apologies for a lot of the examples here being uh, uh, kind of focused on the US. Um, uh, there are different uh, government organizations in different countries. Obviously, there are different policies and so forth. Uh, but there, there often are attempts at uh, uh, by governments for corporate disclosure and revealing uh, information about corporations. In the US, for instance, the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, is an institution that uh, collects information about corporations, specifically uh, uh, to protect investors. Uh, but also that information is useful for us as as researchers uh, and uh, the kinds of documents collected um, uh, become very important sources for our analysis. Uh, there's a wide range of documents produced by corporations themselves. And I'm gonna use, uh, oops, hold on. Uh, I'm gonna try to show you briefly the kind of information that's available 
uh, uh, by corporations, uh, from corporations these days online. Uh, once upon a time, it was difficult sometimes to locate this kind of information. But now, for instance, Disney on their uh, website uh, has a whole section. Uh, I, I, I presume this can be seen, I hope, um, on investor relations. And they include, I'm just going to scroll down, lot, lots of news about the company, news about investor relations. And here, the, what I wanted to point out especially are reports, various kinds of reports, uh, annual reports submitted to the government, other kinds of earning reports, uh, additional information. And here are those Security and Exchange Commission uh, filings. Uh, I won't uh, 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 go into any more um, details, but on the Disney site, for instance, so the annual reports, and also uh, proxy statements, which are sent to stockholders before, well, every year, uh, and provide information to stockholders, which gives us a lot of interesting information about who are the stockholders and um, uh, other developments uh, in the company. And those are available, uh, for instance, on the Disney site at, uh, at this, at this um, location. Uh, okay, the other area of interest that I mentioned uh, is in terms of political relationships. And one of the things that is especially of interest is uh, corporations' relationships with the government. And one source for this in the US, again, uh, but it, it, it is relevant for global companies that sometimes are based in the US. Uh, there are so, uh, sources specifically uh, like this organization called Open Secrets uh, they give information about uh, corporations' relationships with political figures, with the government, uh, political contributions and donations, uh, and lobbying, lobbying efforts and the kinds of money that is uh, 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 dedicated by corporations to influence uh, uh, the government uh, lobbying activities. So that kind of information sometimes is very difficult to uh, find. One of the sources uh, that, that at least in, in the, the US is this open, open secrets. Okay. I want to turn to a case and the case of Disney uh, because I think that um, to give you an example of the kinds of issues we've been talking about, what's involved with corporate research, but also the kind of information, the kinds of information that you find can lead you to an analysis uh, that can expand beyond just finances, beyond just uh, who owns a company. Uh, so I wanna uh, uh, talk about Disney and also, uh, note again that studying the Disney Corporation involves all of these uh, uh, approaches that I mentioned before. We want to open it up to a holistic uh, uh, understanding of a corporation uh, and look at it in an interdisciplinary way and, and, and look at it in terms of, of systems, the whole. Um, I've tried to do this, um, by the way, <laughs> in a book uh, that I did a few years ago called Understanding Disney. And now this is the uh, second edition, which I just finished. Uh, and uh, indeed, um, things constantly change, of course. Uh, and I didn't realize how much actually the Disney company had changed since I had written the book in, in 2000. Um, but it also tries to represent this kind of holistic look at Disney uh, as a corporation uh, are, and, and covered uh, the history of the company, its uh, financial holdings, its uh, organization, and so forth, as well as other components of the, 
uh, of the Disney um, uh, universe, in a sense, uh, uh, what they produce, how they produce it, and who who res uh, who actually engages in uh, consuming those products, and who actually what what uh, audiences um, uh, do with uh, what the products Disney produces. I've tried to do all that in this in this book, but I'm just going to give you a brief overview. In looking at Disney as a corporation, I think I would argue you really have to look at corporation's history. And the Disney history has been written many, 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 many times and continues to be written, especially featuring a uh, uh, well-known figure, Walt Disney, who was integral with the, the, the corporation itself. And we need to absolutely understand the history of a corporation to understand, uh, to truly understand it. Um, the Disney company started in the 20s. Um, it, uh, uh, the company produced cartoons, as you probably know, and uh, uh, the merchandise also accompanying those uh, cartoon figures and characters through the 30s into the 40s. It started producing feature films, specifically Snow White was the first in the 30s and expanded upon uh, um, their feature film production. Into the 50s, however, the company um, uh, diversified uh, as many media companies did by adding television. They were uh, uh, one of the first US companies at least to add television and was very, very uh, uh, involved with, uh, with television as well as opening uh, their first theme park in, in California, which also provided um, uh, new sources of income and uh, through this, this specific uh, form of diversification. Both of these uh, moves were very important. But also the Disney company in the 50s expanded beyond just producing uh, films, cartoons, they added distribution. They had not had distribution before, uh, before the 50s. In fact, they depended on the other, uh, well, many other, a few other Hollywood companies to distribute their products. And this became an important uh, part of their integrative activities. They integrated production and distribution. Uh, this was extremely important and uh, has continued. Um, we want to look at Disney today, which involves a wide range uh, of um, holdings of companies. It's huge. Uh, we want to start with, if we're looking at this corporation, who leads it? Uh, and we have had a number of different corporate heads uh, for the Disney company, uh, Walt Disney through the mid 60s. Uh, then uh, on the right, I believe at the top is Michael Eisner, uh, who led a, a very intensive uh, uh, expansion of the company in terms of diversification. Uh, and the company really did become a major, major Hollywood company. Uh, and, and more recently uh, into the 2000s uh, at the bottom, uh, Robert Iger, Bob Iger uh, has led the company uh, since uh, 2005. These are important. Uh, these are important people. These are important uh, figures, but uh, uh, we need to look beyond just uh, them as leaders. We need to look also at how, um, sorry, I'm going backwards. Um, we need to look at them and how, uh, uh, not only how important they are, but how much they are compensated for their role in the company. Just as an example, and on the right, Bob Iger, who was uh, again, uh, Chief Executive Officer from 2005, uh, has had an enormous compensation package which draw, has drawn a lot of attention uh, most recently. In 2018, because of all the expansion he did, led the company through, uh, he had a total package of, this is, his salary plus a lot of other uh, bonuses and so forth of over $65 million per year uh, each. And, and this is 
gone down recently because the 65 million attracted a lot of attention, but also uh, the, the, the salaries, the, the, the money that uh, CEOs are making these days it, 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 it is getting more attention because it's so uh, out of pace with what individual workers at companies actually make. This continues with the new CEO, Bob Chapik, who took over in February and his uh, salary is much, much, much lower, but also he is going to be receiving bonuses and incentives. And we'll see how much he makes at uh, the end of this year and into, uh, into the future. Uh, beyond management, uh, we have boards of directors. They have a key role in guiding uh, the corporation. This is a sample board of directors from Disney. It's not the latest one, but it highlights how these directors, these board directors um, are connected to other companies specifically. And this is called interlocking directorates. And you can see that potentially the kind of connections may indeed be useful uh, to the company, especially uh, the connections to companies uh, uh, like Facebook, uh, but also uh, uh, other companies that the Disney company works with. Uh, boards of directors are very important. Uh, they don't always represent stock ownership, however. Uh, there are also often huge blocks of stock owned by individuals. And in the past, the Disney company, the Disney family control the corporation. Uh, but in the uh, 80s, uh, at the top, um, there were new uh, players who moved into the company and bought a huge uh, share, huge block of stock uh, and led the expansion of Disney in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, the Bass Brothers, Roy Disney was involved and so forth. I won't go into the details. Uh, more recently at the bottom here, we have Steve Jobs, who you may recognize. Um, and he bought a huge block of stock or became involved with Disney through the connection with Pixar and became the largest uh, stockholder. They are a very important group of people that need to be studied, understood, what their role is. They don't often appear publicly in terms of making uh, announcement statements about the company. They are involved, very interested, obviously, in the company. They're the ones that benefit greatly from the company's success. There is that financial information. Uh, and I think I won't bore you with lots of details, but just basically to note the mission of uh, the Disney company. As other corporations, uh, Disney's uh, objective is to uh, produce shareholder value. And they state this very clearly uh, in their uh, documentation. Uh, and I think the important point here, the company's primary goals, uh, financial goals are to maximize earnings allocate capital profitability, grow long-term shareholder value. And indeed they have done that recently, especially with all of the moves that they've made. Uh, last year, 2019, their revenues were 69, over $69 billion. Their income was over $11 billion. They pr are providing shareholder value. Uh, there are a lot of other details um, uh, in terms of finances that one might be interested in, in looking at. Um, at the moment though, we'll move to uh, the structure of the organization, which it becomes very important uh, for the Disney company that involves these different divisions, media networks, parks, and experiences, studio entertainment, consumer products, and so forth. The structure changes quite actually more often than one might like if we're doing research. Um, and uh, each corporation organizes its activities in uh, various uh, ways, different divisions or uh, uh, subsidiaries and so forth. But the 
uh, structure of the organization is fundamental to understand. Uh, for the Disney company, just to give you an idea of how large they are, how diversified, very briefly, uh, and, and, and this can go on a long time, but very short, briefly, they own various media networks, cable networks, broadcasting networks. They own parks, resorts around the world, as you probably know. Uh, they produce a lot of entertainment under various labels these days since they have purchased Pixar, Lucas, Marvel, and now 20th century uh, uh, Fox's uh, properties. Uh, they produce a wide range of entertainment and media products. Also, they continue to produce huge numbers of products, consumer products and involved in interactive media. Um, uh, and the, we won't go into uh, the details. Most recently, they have started a streaming service as you may be familiar called Disney Plus. It incorporates uh, the different components of uh, the company and has been pretty successful. It would have probably been successful uh, despite uh, the uh, current uh, situation in terms of uh, streaming and media being, uh, media resources being important in terms of what we're going through in terms of this pandemic and people staying at home. So the Disney Plus um, uh, move was, was very important for the Disney company. The Disney company, Disney has been called a universe. And it probably, I would think it probably is apparent why, but I think that it has expanded so much uh, that I, in the recent edition of the Disney book, I'm calling it uh, not just a, a, a universe, but a multiverse. And this may seem a little grandiose or, uh, strange, but I think that it fits a particular definition of, of, of multiverse. Uh, multiverse is a group of multiple universes uh, and uh, or a collection of potentially diverse observable universes. We don't know if there's really uh, multiverses, multiverse, but we can use this uh, metaphor for Disney to understand it. It includes, oops, uh, already uh, these, uni these universes, it's a collection of universes. Marvel calls itself a universe, the Lucasfilm universe, especially Star Wars and Pixar. Uh, so there are universes within the Disney multiverse. There's also this structure that looks uh, like this that uh, just briefly uh, uh, contains a lot of different uh, uh, activities and it comes together in these different divisions under uh, the, the, the umbrella, the multiverse of, of, of Disney, just uh, briefly. I'm including in the Disney multiverse all the corporate components of the Disney company. It would include the management directors, shareholders, as we've mentioned, the corporate ethos, policies, strategies, divisions and so forth, all of that is included. But also content, the narratives, Disney themes, styles, values, meanings, and audiences. And I think that all of those need to be included here, again, in this kind of looking at the whole of Disney and I'm putting that under the Disney multiverse. In the book, I talk about various strategies. It's not enough to under, uh, look at what a company owns, but what they do with their holdings and uh, their policies, their strategies. For Disney, uh, uh, synergy is very important in uh, working together. Synergy is a um, key poli uh, uh, policy and strategy uh, where different parts of the whole are connected and Disney does this amazingly. Um, expand, they have expanded their brand recently by 
uh, various ways, uh, purchasing different companies, uh, 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 different adding new brands. They have also deepened the demographics appealing to a broader range of, of, of audiences. They really control their company and their products and their uh, intellectual property and their labor. The issue of control is key. Uh, and I'll just suggest there's a lot of ways that they do that. They have also expanded globally. They have expanded in terms of uh, uh, their technological activities and technology is a key to understanding some of the uh, uh, expansion of the Disney company. They market the company, they promote it uh, in numerous ways and using various strategies. And also they are very, very uh, attentive these days to uh, pointing out how they are socially responsible as many corporations do uh, through corporate social responsibility. All those strategies are detailed and come from uh, uh, the kind of corporate analysis that, that, I, that I've been talking about. We can expand corporate analysis to uh, look at other components, as I've noted, content, audiences, effects, cultural, economic, and political impact. We can do all of those things, and I try to do that in the book, um, but I don't know if I want, to, if I have time, just briefly, and I'll zoom through some of this to give you a sense of these other areas of analysis. Um, one is, of course, the content and looking at what Disney produces, reading the Disney multiverse. And Walt Disney uh, didn't think uh, there was any meaning to what he did except entertainment, and he often said that um, he would let the professors tell us what they mean. He just wanted to make the pictures. Uh, however, there is meaning, obviously, in what Disney produces, and they know it. Uh, they uh, state this in so many ways. Uh, they, they claim that their themes and characters are universal, relevant to everyone, and so forth, and accessible and, uh, to everyone. Uh, some people would uh, challenge those claims. Uh, some people also would uh, say that Disney's doing a much better job of that these days. In fact, there is, uh, we can look at an old Disney and a new Disney. Some people argue that there's much better, for instance, representation of gender and diversity uh, in Disney products these days. Uh, and it's receiving a lot of attention. Uh, obviously, there have been uh, these very interesting examples of the of, uh, kind of uh, different kinds of treatments of specifically um, uh, minorities. Um, however, there's also been some kind of a, a bit of resistance to that uh, with, um, for instance, this uh, uh, image uh, where there are those that don't see that some of the representations are all that uh, are, are totally positive or uh, that there are still issues involved. Um, there are also uh, uh, those that point to the continued commodification of those uh, images. We may have stronger, more empowered Disney heroines, but they still uh, have, uh, are associated, the Disney princesses, especially with lots and lots and lots of products. Um, Disney audiences can also be analyzed and in the book, everything from fanatics to resistors have been uh, noted. There are people who adore Disney. There are people who despise Disney. Uh, and I think it's really interesting to see the wide range of responses uh, to uh, something called Disney. Uh, and there are more and more uh, researchers analyzing uh, uh, that, uh, but I think also we can e extend that and expand our analysis of corporations to obviously include audiences as consumers, uh, uh, obviously. Um, Disney also, of course, has had an impact. Uh, it has had an impact on Hollywood. 
it is dominating, has dominated uh, the box office or was dominating the box office when box offices were open uh, in, in, a, in a very uh, real way and uh, uh, it, it's, it's very significant. However, we also, I want to point to why it's important to understand uh, Disney and the financial aspects. And, uh, and it's because of this image that maybe we're familiar with, this wealth pyramid, it's income inequality. Some people may, are making an enormous amount of money from this kind of activity that Disney does. Uh, and also continue to uh, produce products, commodities, reinforce commodity uh, uh, culture. And uh, I think Disney plays a key role in that. And uh, that certainly is a part of a political economic analysis, but I think I must mention it uh, to say why all of this is, is, is important. Also, I want to just briefly note that the Disney company has recently been increasingly promoting their greening activities uh, and uh, again, it takes a particular Di Disney uh, feel to it, uh, approach to it. Um, and, but also there are those that are a few uh, pointing to problems of arguing that Disney is truly uh, uh, not uh, contributing to problems with the climate, with the environment. Uh, I, um, and there's, there's, I think, some very interesting work being done here from a political economic analysis. And uh, I'm currently trying to work on Disney and its role in these kinds of activities. It also might be noted, just as I conclude, that the Disney company isn't inevitable. It won't go on forever, possibly. Uh, in fact, it may be experiencing very difficult times these days, as, as are many corporations, as are many global corporations. Uh, is Disney fading um, despite their recent success and growth? Uh, we have to watch that uh, to see. Uh, and especially uh, as we know, um, the challenge of uh, uh, recent um, uh, global uh, uh, developments is really been a challenge for uh, Disney as well as other global media corporations. I think I will stop there and thank you very much uh, for your attention. And I hope I didn't go too much over and there's still possibly some time for um, questions and, and uh, discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Roscoe. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Pandey or Professor Chaudhary, do I directly uh, yeah, take you, up you, the questions? You, you, yes. you, are the, you are the chairperson. You can immediately go over to question answer. There are many questions, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been just uh, kind of following them. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Vasco, for this uh, extremely insightful session. I think you should really have some water. Uh, because we are going to have like some questions coming your way or your coffee. Uh, 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 but thank you so much for first laying down a fantastic conceptual, theoretical and uh, a methodological framework for us to understand how to study media corporations. And then, of course, from your very, very uh, extensive work on the Walt Disney Company to establish uh, whatever you spoke about earlier as a case in point to be able to understand how this conceptual, theoretical and methodological framework can be applied to study for example, a media giant. So, uh, so I think uh, the groundwork was uh, something that really helped us see through your, uh, how you kind of studied this media giant and how the study continues to expand. Uh, there are a lot of questions uh, like uh, Professor Chaudhary uh, was mentioning and uh, you know, uh, the chat window has them, but I'll just read, read out the questions and you know, uh, I'll first uh, just say uh, uh, hello to all the colleagues out here uh, because, you know, there is a mix of questions and comments. 
and uh, uh, so and mostly there are a lot of people who are just saying hi in between so i have to kind of keep going back and forth into what's a question so i've tried to do a little bit of a sorting out uh, to understand where are the questions and uh, uh, i'm going to uh, uh, just say sorry to all my colleagues here because i'll not use salutations before your names because i don't know like what you represent a lot of times so forgive me if i don't call you a doctor or a professor i'll just call everybody with their names and go ahead i hope you'll be okay with that uh, uh the first question that I, I i actually saw was from samir patankar and i don't know like do i ask the question or do, do i ask mr patankar to ask the question no no you you ask the questions and you moderate the questions and yeah, we have just yeah one. that's right yeah sure just, so there are some 20, questions we have 20 minutes for the questions so within that time so sure thank you thank you for that so uh, samir asks uh, professor vasco that how do how to how do you see the relevance of the theory of manufacturing consent by chomsky in today's world with reference to political economy of media it's a very very good question and thank you uh showing a familiarity with with uh, uh various approaches to political economy and i think that uh uh chomsky and um uh, herman uh book which also has been uh uh revised and so forth uh is really important and it has really uh uh been significant to point to uh the way that corporations and their control of media have influenced uh the political landscape uh and so forth i think that one of the things that uh um to and, and so I, and again also they have revised uh their uh their various uh observations uh i i, th I think one question that, that i've been asked before is how does it relate to entertainment because there's an emphasis on news and uh information and and so forth in their uh in their analysis and but there are parts of their analysis that can apply to entertainment and there are those parts that involve uh a control and commodification uh and and advertising and other kinds of influences on media and they are also influential on entertainment media and some of those uh frames also that they mention are included in the content of entertainment media. Uh so I think in that way uh their approach is is appropriate but I think when we talk about some media companies and especially Disney we have to uh add that notion of entertainment and cultural products. So I'll leave it at that. yeah thank you in fact uh, the next question is also like uh, so anuradha bhattacharjee asks that besides corporation what other kind of institutions can be investigated investigated using the political economy of media kind of framework great and i apologize for not being more expansive uh corporations are just one kind of institution as i kind of noted but uh also certainly governments become involved here and there are uh different components of governments that 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 can be investigated in this way for instance those involved with media communications are of special interest to us in the us for instance the federal communications commission uh the security and exchange commission is involved with uh, uh corporations but fcc is involved in specifically communications uh so that could be investigated that way so uh uh the other uh institutions involved uh I, oh wait and let me back up and also say that uh corporations uh need to be expanded in terms of those uh we can look at corporations implying for profit but we can also look at an and an analyze non-profit organizations and hopefully uh to uh understand them and also help uh build a uh, promote them in my perspective i think that's really really important 
Um, and so there are other um, types of uh, companies. There are also institutions such as, I, I mentioned banks, uh, uh, religious uh, institutions, uh, educational institutions also have been analyzed in terms it, from this perspective. Uh, I focus on corporations here because I just think they're still so, sorry, powerful <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, the array of media that we have uh, these days. I hope that uh, uh, starts to answer that question. Yeah, and I think this like there are some uh, follow up questions, you know, but I'm going to combine two questions now. Uh, one question is by uh, Professor Ujwal Chaudhary, who says that state surveillance is rising uh, because of the hegemony of certain business and media elites being established in several de several democratic countries and. How do you even look at the prospects of unaligned democratic and small media initiatives ahead? And then there is a question tied up with it by Shahid Rasool, who says that corporations are highly secretive about their transactions and processes, especially in this part of the world. You know, he's referring to South Asia in particular. And how does one break this tough wall to get authentic information without falling in any trap? Two very good points, and um, uh, I think that the uh, the first one uh, pertaining to uh, I think if I understood the uh, the point, uh, looking at large corporations and giants uh, is one thing, but how what do we do with the wide array of different kinds of organizations and companies and individuals, smaller media activities. Uh, we we must and 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 it's not just sometimes uh, in terms of uh, the study of political economy and media we become really fixated and, and focus most of our attention on these uh, huge uh, for profit corporations that are, that are global uh, we must acknowledge if we can't uh, uh, direct more attention to smaller companies and uh, uh, other kinds of organizations. Um, and uh, by the study, hopefully critical study of, of the large media corporations, perhaps learn what some of the vulnerability vulnerabilities are uh, in order to uh, help assist with uh, the expansion of more uh, perhaps nonprofit or smaller kinds of media activities. I think it's, uh, that's very important uh, uh, to understand and, and to work towards. Uh, yes, <laughs> secrets. Corporations tend to be secretive. They don't want everyone knowing uh, what they're doing, how much money they're making. And I realize there's a, uh, a wide array of situations uh, uh, in different countries in terms of, of, of not being able to access information. Let me just say that uh, when I first started doing this, there was certainly that issue with uh, uh, corporations uh, in the US. The question was, how do you get access to information? Uh, and the secretiveness. Now there's an immense amount of information, uh, but it that very uh, amount of information makes it sometimes difficult to sort it out and figure out what does it mean uh, and analyze it. Uh, not to say we don't want information, because we do. Uh, it, I, I will only say that is a challenge uh, and sometimes you just can't get to the uh, information that you want or feel that you need. And in your research, by the way, I, I don't think it's, uh, it should not be a problem to say this was unavailable and perhaps address the question of why. I couldn't find out this information, uh, but why couldn't I? Why is it uh, uh, secretive? Uh, again, I don't have any uh, other great insights at, at that point at the moment, other than uh, also for us to be working in our specific uh, areas, um, in our locations, to push for there to be more uh, corporate disclosure. Sure. 
Yeah, uh, so a very interesting question that's come from Nisha Pawar is that, uh, can you uh, help us understand some new Marxist approaches or critical theories on global media ownership? Uh, in two minutes? Uh, no, uh, I mean. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, no, I, I, um, I think that, uh, uh, First of all, the point I was trying to make is that uh, I'm hoping that we can also understand that it's uh, also beyond just ownership. Ownership is fundamental. And I think that there, there are some really good studies, I think, in uh, uh, specifically in India. My uh, dear colleague, Prado Thomas, uh, has, has done a lot of work on that. And I appreciate mm -hmm. his work very much. Um, I think there are um, challenges to doing the, the, the work, but also it is so important these days and is, has grown that there are new, new approaches. Uh, but I also want to say that there's some fundamental things that I think are part of old approaches that are still relevant. Uh, I think some of the newer developments relate to what I was trying to get to is expanding to why political economic uh, analysis is important to understand content, representation, sure. uh, reception, and so forth. And some of the work that's being done now uh, incorporates or works with people doing that kind of analysis. So I would say that, that, that new developments, and I'm not getting into specifically Marxist um, uh, approaches, uh, but I think the, uh, the expansion, as I was saying, this political economy plus needs to be, is, is happening. Um, it's difficult because you can't do everything, Absolutely. by the way. Yeah, uh, but, yeah. Yeah, but working I, with other people is, is often a good idea. Research collaboration uh, 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 is, is one way uh, to, to look at the whole, uh, you know. Sure, sure. Uh, actually, uh, you know, the, 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 the next question uh, by uh, SR Sanjeev is especially about the four tech giants who are recently being questioned in the US Congress and uh, uh, he actually wants to ask if, uh, you know, uh, the socio-political context that has got created by the pandemic and the politics in terms of corporate transparency. I mean, he specifically wants to ask how serious is the concern for big technology giants to work with governments in surveilling the society, particularly during this pandemic and your views on that. Ah, uh, yes. Um, thank you for uh, adding that point, which brings us to, I mean, just last week, these um, tech giants uh, heads were being uh, invest in questioned uh, by Congress. And uh, uh, one of the issues, was, uh, certainly uh, transparency is an important point, uh, but one of the issues was also surveillance. Uh, one of the points I wanted to make uh, in, before though was the potential for resources uh, uh, for this kind of uh, uh, study can come from those kinds of government investigations and hearings. However, looking at those hearings as an example, uh, I think I noted or read that they that those hearings produce that investigation and produced, oh, produced over a million pages of documents. So uh, uh, how does one make sense of all of that? Um, uh, that? I think that's one of the ways that you can be transparent, but be elusive and, 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 and protective. Uh, as far as working with the government in terms of surveillance, I mean, the whole discussion was quite interesting, but I don't think we should uh, think of this only at the moment. It, it's been the case in the past, of course, that, that these corporations and some media communication corporations have been 
<laughs> intimately involved with the government in terms of, of surveillance activities, producing the technologies. Uh, I, the Disney company during World War II, Walt Disney and his relationship with the FBI, which I won't go into, <laughs> uh, but there it's been there. Um, so this is not, uh, it, it, lots of things are new about the situation we're in now, of course, but I think some of these things uh, are, not you know, have been continuing. Sure, I'll, I'll I there. think you've already touched upon like uh, uh, the context of the pandemic. So I'm gonna skip a couple of questions out there, but there are two questions which are interrelated and I'm gonna specifically focus on that. So there is one question which uh, by Muhammad Mohyuddin, which specifically asks about the relationship of uh, uh, possibly the Disney corporation to Asia in general and India in particular. And uh, related to it in particular is a question that when an organization, a media company like Disney diversifies itself into the rest of the world uh, and there are instances of resistance and backlash, how do they cope up with it? So I'm just tying up the two questions and that question is by Sapna Nayak. So I'm just tying up the two questions to kind of get a perspective, uh, you know, maybe an example from the Asian region or something which can help us understand this. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, another uh, good question. And um, I, I think that there are examples that many of you may be aware of in terms of the kinds of activities that go on by the Disney Corporation in India. Uh, and and in, in Asia, all over the world, Disney products <laughs> are still uh, widely uh, distributed and, and consumed. Uh, so we just have to kind of uh, take that as a, a, a fundamental point. Um, uh, and of course, the films and television products and so forth, and now with streaming, uh, the Disney company itself and its products are out there. Uh, but also Disney has, has uh, a couple of key uh, holdings in India, I believe. And uh, I think that the, the, the point of, uh, companies like Disney coming into uh, countries, uh, sometimes they are welcome with open arms, uh, uh, especially in terms of, for instance, where they have um, built theme parks. Um, but other times, of course, there is that resistance. And I really think that it's important to uh, I'm always uh, amazed with my students who uh, uh, just assume that everyone loves Disney, of course. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> and especially when you have Disney coming into company, uh, countries and um, uh, dominating in certain areas, like I'm thinking of computer animation, uh, and other kinds of activities. Uh, and and it, I know that's been an issue in, in Korea, for instance. And, uh, and of course, there's an ongoing relationship with China that, you know, that is, uh, comes, goes. It, 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 I would say that corporations like Disney are constantly uh, trying to figure out the balance between maximizing those profits, but also not uh, being resisted by governments, by citizens and so forth. So uh, they are uh, needing all the time to adjust their strategies. Uh, do you present local uh, content? Uh, do you do a, a, a film like Mulan? <laughs> Or do you go in with uh, 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 Western Westernized products, uh, which aren't prop as problematic, perhaps? So it, it's it's a it's a negotiation, it's an adjustment, and they're constantly um, assessing it. I think that uh, uh, Disney specifically has become a little more publicly aware of the need to be sensitive to cultural differences. 
Yeah. And I, I'll just like, I'll just wrap up the question answers because we're really now running short in time. And uh, there are a, there are a lot of questions, but uh, I'll just kind of combine the essence of a few questions uh, and take this last thing so that we can wrap up on that. So uh, there are uh, scholars and colleagues who are again asking questions about Disney's stereotypical representation of gender, race, body image, you know, which despite all the changes that it's trying to make in its content is something that has ailed, you know, the entire narrative of Disney over years. So that's one part of the questions being repeatedly asked. The second question that's uh, coming up is like, uh, actually, I really want to raise this question because this is from a colleague in Bangladesh, who, uh, you know, uh, Madhav Das, who really wants to ask that, does what Walt Disney represent uh, is a model for today's Hollywood or rest of the world also because, you know, of the kind of cultural dominance that a company like that has. And then there are a lot of colleagues who have especially asked about the corporate social responsibility of Disney in general and in very specifically in the context of the pandemic. So I'm just like kind of wrapping all these three themes together and maybe a solid punch from you to close this question <laughs> answer session. Mm. My solid punch is <laughs> related to the representation questions. I, um, there's a lot of material written about that. And, uh, but I think that, uh, um, uh, I think that it needs to be uh, carefully read in terms of whether or not it's written by a, a, a Disney fan or fanatic versus someone who is more critically oriented. Uh, but, al but also, um, I think that there are very good uh, arguments to be made that, that the representation uh, is still, Disney's representation, especially of gender and race, is still problematic. I'll leave that there. I, 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 some, all of these questions actually, it's terrible, I can refer you to the book, my book, uh, which is um, the second edition specifically, um, where I try to go into that and relate the kind of political economic analysis to content and to audiences. The question of corporate social responsibility also is something that I've expanded on. And the, the corporation is doing all of these things that they're very proud of, uh, of greening their company, but they still have these theme parks that bring people to different parts of the world and involve an enormous amount of travel and consumption. Are they being affected by this pandemic? In that sense, absolutely yes. And um, it, it, I, I don't want to go into very much more detail because we're out of time, but uh, again, uh, the corporations aren't invulnerable. Uh, they are still uh, susceptible to these kinds of um, challenges. And this, this period of time is indeed a real challenge. I I'll just leave it that, it's too general, but. Sure, but thank you so much, Professor Vasco for all those comments and for taking so many questions and thank you uh, uh, to the to the organizers uh, uh, and I think over to you uh, Dr. Pandey and Professor Chaudhary to take the proceedings further thank you no we have we have the closing thank comments you. from uh, uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Pradeep uh, Dr. Pradeep Malik who would be speaking one on the entire presentation and also connecting to Indian context there are some examples some questions connecting to Indian context people are asking already so it would be great and timely to listen to the head of the Department of School of Liberal Studies of Pandit Dindal Petroleum University, Gujarat, Dr. Pradeep Malik, Professor Pradeep Malik to uh, have a concluding comments, summarizing and also connecting to Indian context. Over to Dr. Malik. Thank you, uh, Professor Chaudhary. Um, am I audible? Yeah, you are. Thank you. you, are. Thank, you. you are. thank you, Professor Chaudhary. First of all, uh, let us thank uh, Professor Vasco for such a wonderful presentation, uh, telling us about uh, uh, 
Dr. Uh, Ruchi Jaggi for conducting it in such a nice way. There were so many questions and I think she has done justice with so many of them. I was watching those questions in the chat box and the way she has combined some of them. First of all, again, um, <clears throat> my job is to conclude a very, very difficult thing to do. To conclude, to summarize such a wonderful presentation our long presentation by Professor Vasco. Uh, she, towards the end, uh, or, or the later part of her talk, she was talking about uh, Disney. Uh, I mean, uh, it was bound to happen that the entire focus got, you know, got, entire discussion got focused on Disney. So there were people who talked about what to do more about the So, Thank you, uh, Professor Vasco, for introducing us to this metaphor called Disney, which is a reality. And if reality could be metaphor or metaphor could be reality, here is an example. Um, earlier, you also gave us some uh, fundamentals, some insight into. I was taking some points as I was listening to you, so I'll have to tell us about how to investigate the awareness. Then some, you know, uh, some of some of the researchers, some of us can take up those cues and proceed further. Maybe get into some more research. You also gave references to uh, at least two books. One was the edited volume, Media uh, Global Media Giants. And your own social media network and access, so which you showed us how to interact, the interest, how the interest. Their, their function as media people. Um, and when we, you were giving us the example of uh, this uh, social network analysis and you talked about uh, how they were connected, immediately uh, my attention was drawn to the Indian reality, which as Professor Chaudhary said that I'm supposed to be afraid of. Well, um, Indian reality uh, is, is not very... Yes. Uh, difficult to difficult to unravel actually it is much too obvious in 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 the us you said you had to you know you had to hunt for some of the documents where to get them and that society american society puts on uh, it's very understandable in india also we have certain rules on privacy and all but you know, it's so very obvious in India that one doesn't really have to, uh, you know, struggle much to get the Indian reality, to get to the root of the Indian reality. Also, um, uh, quite a lot of documents are available with the company registrar where we do get to know about India's, uh, you know, media holdings and all. And you referred to how, you know, uh, one particular organization or a few organizations, how they are dominating the the, the, the global scene. So coming to India, I mean, though we all know India, we are largely an state country, but media laws in our country, especially those related to ownership and concentration, very, very fragmented. And so what has happened um, is that a very small number of media owners, uh, they have taken a you know, stranglehold on the media, uh, the media scene in India. Um, India, as we all know, is one of the biggest media markets in the world. But simply because it is biggest media market, uh, and there are there is a presence of a large number of media outlets, that does not mean that does not necessarily translate into a pluralistic media landscape. We have more than a hundred thousand registered publications some 600 odd FM stations, nearly 900, uh, you know, satellite channels. Of these 900, some 400 are in the news and current affairs domain. And none of us has uh, the count of the media websites that are into uh, news and current affairs. But the, the number sounds very impressive, you know. 
uh, of course these numbers are uh, you know for such a big country population wise uh, these numbers are very very impressive but unfortunately um, this large number of media outlet does not automatically translate into a variety in supply what i mean by variety of in supply is very in the supply of content this is even more so unfortunate if we take into account the cultural diversity of india from east to west and north to south we have massive massive diversity and we are running short of time uh, uh take the example of just the four or five leading hindi dailies in the country and i'm referring to more four or five as i said you know the dainik jagran hindustan uh, amar ujala dainik bhaskar these are some of the top uh, you know uh, hindi dailies in the country and just three of i mean four or five of them they account for more than 3/4 of the hindi readership go to the regional languages half the market you know um situation is not different much different in other languages also uh take the case of english uh so the top english weekly is also the owner of a very popular uh news channel the largest english daily in the country also owns one of the most popular tv news and current affairs channel in the country it also owns a niche television channel reporting business it also has the largest metro city center television channel and uh, it also has it also owns the largest and probably the most popular uh, fm entertainment radio station actually a chain of radio stations you know so you see the ownership is concentrated in a few hands what you would refer to um, chomsky you know when he was talking about uh, license to publish you know um, so that is what is Uh, you know just, just just four or five of them in india also they are they are they are owning this media landscape now now add to this the financial and other industry interests that these media houses have and you have a very very disturbing landscape in india most of the media house houses they are owned by large conglomerates and they are still controlled by founding families families which invest in a vast array of industries and other media you know and now this brings me to the issue of regulation the flaws in regulation this concentration of media ownership is obviously because of the result of lots of huge gaps in the regulatory framework to safeguard this media pluralism and prevent this concentration no limit has been placed on the limit of ownership either in print or any any medium you know and um no limit has been placed either on on in the sense of ownership either individually or in combination what i mean by combination is actually uh, you know the cross media concentration now add another deadly input to this and that is the political affiliation of these media owners and when you add this you we are in a real mess you look carefully into the ownership pattern and you see some of the leading outlets are controlled by individuals with political ties at the national level as well as as the regional level in fact if you go delve deeper into the regional level the more deep you go the more obvious it becomes uh, there are quite a few you know be it uh, the southern media scape the northern india scape or even the eastern india uh, you know media scape this is how things are um my job as i was given was to summarize what you were you have uh, talked about professor vasco and as it's very difficult to summarize the entire thing in such a short you know few minutes uh, but thank you very much these are some of the, the these are some of the ideas that that were coming to my mind as i was listening to you uh, the india i didn't name any particular organization but overall if you see this is how uh, the ownership is and this is how concentration is becoming uh, you know the ownership is becoming more and more concentrated uh, by the day and uh, in fact somebody has said that a particular you know industrial house very soon will own nearly 80% of 
one particular industrial house and very soon earned, owned the nearly 80% of the media in the country. The day is not very far because he is very moving in that direction very fast. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think um, in the few minutes that I had, four or five minutes, I have tried to sum up what you have said. And I've also tried to bring to attention people, uh, to people's attention, the Indian reality. Thank you very much. Thanks for, the, thanks for the India connection. Thanks for the India connection. Thank you. Very well said in Indian context. Thank you, Dr. Malik, for the India connection. Over to Dr. Umashankar Pandey for our, our hero of this program. It's with, without whom very much. we would not have had such scholar like Janet Vasco, ma'am, to be here with us today. Thank you for Uma once again. Over to you to bring this session to an end and also talk about tomorrow's program. What, wh what are we going to do at what time? Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Professor Chaudhary. Uh, I'm personally indebted to uh, Professor Janet Vasco for all this. I mean, I was there in 2012 uh, in Durban when she was elected uh, the president for the first time, and the last eight years have, I mean, have been you know such a wonderful time for me personally. I was there at Leicester also when she was elected for the second time. So, uh, and she's always backed us. She's always encouraged us. And what a master class it was. Uh, uh, I'll just take this opportunity to just, you know, uh, uh, summarize a few points again for the benefit of our, uh, uh, you know, viewers right now and also for, for the YouTube audience. So the crux of uh, Professor Janet Vasco's uh, uh, presentation today was why critical political economy plus analysis is important to understand content. And then she, uh, uh, you know, uh, spoke of a framework which is holistic, which is... Uh, integrative, which is interdisciplinary, and which is uh, systemic. Uh, she spoke of uh, four different methods of, of, you know, how to go about it, starting off with document analysis, interviews, participant observation, and uh, uh, ethnography as well. The document analysis could be anything from manuscripts to letters and diaries to records to web pages to minutes to returns and, you know, a lot of the things. And two very important issues uh, related to... Uh, document analysis uh, she spoke of was the issue of access and the issue of authorship. And, uh, you know, there was, there's, there's, you know, a lot to do uh, when, you know, uh, and there were questions on access as well. Uh, uh, a lot of questions were there. Uh, the criterion uh, she uh, spoke for uh, the document analysis was from John Scott's A Matter of Record and four elements again there of, of authenticity, of credibility, of, of representativeness and of meaning. Uh, investigating corporations, uh, uh, you know, uh, she spoke about uh, the properties uh, of the corporations, the financial status, the board of directors, the bank relationships, the lawsuits, the political contributions, a very, very important element, the, the labor relationships and the relationships with other companies as well. Uh, she also uh, spoke about the governmental corporate documents and the documents produced by corporations as well, especially, uh, you know, the Open Secrets uh, uh, website. And uh, then the case study was such a phenomenal, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, insight into Disney, starting off, you know, from the 30s and 40s to how in the 50s it diversified to television and then to, you know, the theme parks and then, in, you know, how it added uh, uh, film distribution. She uh, introduced us to the corporate heads there and, you know, how in the 80s it, it expanded, you know, uh, again in a different uh, way. Uh, the 2019 income is a staggering 11 billion uh, dollars and, you know, about 69 billion in revenue. So uh, the structure of Disney she introduced was about the media networks they have, the parks, the studio entertainment, the consumer products and the interactive media. And of late, the streaming services, the Disney Plus, which includes the Pixar, uh, the Marvel, the Star Wars and, and National Geographic. Uh, the uh, concept of uh, Disney universe to multiverse, you know, of multiple universes, again, is, is a, such a wonderful concept, you know, for us to uh, have, have insight in the Indian context. So, so things about the, and, and three uh, universes she spoke of was the Marvel universe, the Lucas universe, and the Pixar universe. Uh, uh, most importantly, you know, uh, looking at uh, the audiences also is a very important strategy that, uh, you know, uh, she spoke of. Uh, uh, the, the, the Disney strategy of, of synergy, of expanding the brand, of deepening the demographics, of, you know, control, of globalization, of using technology, of, of marketing the mouse, as she said, and uh, finally, you know, using corporate social responsibility to, uh, you know, for, for their image management. 
uh, the representation of uh, 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 gender and diversity, you know, has been, uh, uh, you know, has 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 uh, had a sea change in the last few years. Uh, uh, among the audiences, again, she provided us, you know, such a fantastic insight from fanatics to fans to consumers to cynics to resistors and to an an antagonists. So it's not just about uh, the uh, 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 you know uh, content itself, but about the audience as well. And uh, uh, finally, she touched upon the income inequality and you know the uh, going green or the green washing and the issues related to that. Uh, I can't thank you enough, Professor Vasco, for this, and I'm sure you know a lot of uh, uh, our Indian scholars and researchers will will remain indebted to you for for this. And I'm sure you know we'll have uh, a lot more quality uh, you know uh, uh, issues coming up uh, following this. And uh, we have planned other activities as well. So I'll keep pestering you to wake up this early in the morning, maybe uh, when possible, for another uh, uh, you know webinar series uh, whenever you can. Uh, thanks again to Professor Ruchi Kher Jaggi. You know her her support has always been there. You know and, and uh, in every way, you know she's been such a big support. You know and and without you know people like uh, Ruchi and and uh, Pradeep ji, you know such a you know they are they are such wonderful people. You know apart from being such accomplished academics, that uh, you know we we managed to do this. Uh, Professor Ujjal Chaudhary is the uh, pillar behind the show, and and you know uh, I I remain indebted to him for a number of things. Uh, so uh, this uh, 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 you know webinar series wouldn't have been possible in this form without his active support you know 24 7 you know we, we uh, discuss at two o'clock in the night and again six o'clock in the morning so uh, thanks again uh, professor vasco professor ruchi kerjaki professor pradeep malik professor ujjal choudhury we have uh, professor graham murdoch tomorrow at 3 p.m india time the uh, link remains the same as uh, the one on the first day. Only for today, you know, we had a different link because uh, of, of the time difference. And uh, uh, from tomorrow, we'll have the same link. So we'll uh, assemble uh, at 2.45, all of us. And uh, we are having a fascinating discussion on, on uh, uh, you know, virtual ethnography uh, uh, by, by Professor Murdoch, you know, one of the global stalwarts in the real sense of the term. Thanks again, U everybody. USP, I would like to add that people are asking for the presentation there has been a facebook live and a youtube live of adamus university the indareal.in the policytimes.com any of these platforms if you go the entire presentation is there plus this whole presentation yesterday and today are being covered by different media ananda bazar group abpeducation.com and also the uh, indareal.in so we will be putting these links in all the social media groups and WhatsApp groups from where you have already known about this program. Thank you for everyone's presence. I find uh, colleagues from Africa, from Western Asia, from Bangladesh, from Nepal and India. That much I could uh, relate to. There may be a few others whom I couldn't perhaps uh, recognize. Thank you, everyone. And let's meet 3 p.m. tomorrow for the Doyen. Professor Emeritus, Dr. Murdoch, Graham Murdoch. Bye.